let's jump right in. Emotional pollution is a global crisis today. And yet, while we sign environmental pollution petitions, even public interest litigations, scant attention is paid to the muck we hold within ourselves. Do any of you remember the first contaminant that entered your mind space? Mine was anger, age six. My mom was being unfair and unkind, and that kid didn't like it one bit. Do you remember your first banging headache? I do, age eight. A new contaminant, guilt came in. Good children were supposed to love their parents, and not meeting this norm left that kid with adverse effects. Now, as babies, we're all born with an unsoiled, unconditioned palate, a clean slate, no preconceived notions. A baby takes a plunge into this world completely oblivious to whatever is in store ahead. And we are said to be spiritual beings here for the human experience. The leap of faith drives a baby's spirit. And emotions, of course, we feel even as babies. But we don't carry these memories as feelings, at least not yet. It is this uncomplicated simplicity, this innocent purity, that is difficult to retain as we grow on in years. The spirit is absolutely corrupted by the personality of the ego, says Swami Vivekananda, and refers to us ego driven human beings as mustached babies. Did you know that when a baby begins to understand that it is an entity all by itself, separate from its parents, from its environment, it begins to attach to the I, me, my, mine ego. The ego of doing, of being, now, by the end of this talk, you guys will figure that my life is only a standard textbook case. I grew up in a volatile, dysfunctional, madcap of a violent home. At age nine, I was pulverized for failing math by two marks. And I don't know what happened. But I was suddenly standing somewhere else and watching that kid getting beaten. The funny part, I was perfectly aware that both fractions are me. That nine-year-old even understood that not all adults are right and that not all children are stupid. By 11, unfortunately or fortunately, I faced as much threat from the outside world of people as I did from the inside road mishaps, sexual harassment, war sirens, blackouts, and a whole lot of unfamiliar adult emotions began to crowd my intelligence. So I had to learn street smartness in a hurry. I had to outwit the enemy. Doesn't mean that I became an oversmart shana. I then understood that everyone has something to teach me and words to comfort me, if only I was interested in paying attention. Use your brains before they rust. You're given two and more of them, said Koki teacher, a maths teacher. And the reason, my dears, is to think and reason, she said. Study time is not worry time, said bell teacher. So I taught myself, Playtime is not cry time. And then came, you are not just a 12-year-old. So drop your frivolous immaturity, Marathi teacher. By your age, girls were making babies and raising families like it was my fault. It certainly explains our mature, responsible society, ma'am, I said, tongue-in-cheek. And she said, exactly. So grow up. Point taken. 
These unknowingly became my solutions to ease my confusion and pain. And I taught myself to become my own parent, teacher, best friend, and guide. While facing a final exam the next morning, and after an entire evening of housework, mind and body bashing, I mastered the craft of silencing my agitated mind. How? By setting a time limit on misery. Mantra, control hona mangta hai. Not easy to rope in a libid appalled mind. But I could cajole the aching me gently. It's called talking reason with the inner child. I could not afford to fail another exam, not without repercussions. So what's got to be done has got to be done. Great mantra to use in life. I would just stare out of the window and allow my mind to wander. Making peace with all that I was feeling and experiencing. Waiting. Just waiting for my mind to let go of all the wretchedness and fury. My shallow, agitated breath would soon settle into even deep breathing. The pit in the gut would release itself, and I would snap back into focus and study. Anytime you're stressed, try it. It works like magic. I learned to close every moment within the moment and lived moment to moment. No residue carried forth whatsoever. I began to hold emotions much later. By 20, I had a solid legal case of child abuse and domestic violence, which I chose not to file. The welfare of other dependent siblings was at stake here, and that apart, my parents were not my enemies. They believed in authoritarian parenting. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Victims, I guess. Now what can I say? Before reaching 30, I gave birth to a dead baby. After a full term, post-mature, overdue pregnancy, and five days of intensive, exhaustive labor, I still feel the pangs of that loss. At 40, I was in therapy, only to realize that my magnet had attracted emotionally unavailable relationships. Merely a byproduct of a dysfunctional upbringing, and only because I was emotionally unavailable to myself. And that really hurt. Now, professionally, I ran a gaming firm called Boffins. A boffin, by definition, is the ultimate authority on any given subject. And modesty those days just happened to be my middle name. The idea was to introduce fun into adult lives, to tap into that child element, to pump up that inner kid, and help de-stress. While I was busy enjoying professional success, I grew to be almost 100 kilos. Play went missing from my adult life. And no excuse can justify that dichotomy. Putting the petition down for my divorce, from moment A to moment Z, spanning 24 years, raked up age-old painful memories. And the unfairness of all of it had me writhing in pain. Self-pity, righteous wrath, and hopelessness exploding out of every orifice. The effort took me three and a half months and more while working consecutive shifts night and day. It meant lousy food habits, erratic sleep cycles, smoking like a chimney, binge drinking whenever possible, poor gut health, nutritional deficiencies galore, and all consuming grief and resentment overpowering my core intelligence. Emotional pollution had me in its clutches by now and how. My ego took a severe battery. 46 years on this planet, and I had absolutely nothing to show for it, material or otherwise. 
wasting an entire lifetime pursuing a dream, a one passport, one love-filled dream. Adolescent idealism at its mocking best. I couldn't even hold a family together. And my breaking point came with my cancer, August 2006, which was at best nature's friendly slap across my face. So what emotional pollution does, it causes you constant frustration, dissatisfaction, a sense of grief, a sense of loss, a sense of being bereft. Why? Because you're trying to alleviate this hollowness, this emptiness, this sense of defeat that you feel from what you think you deserve and what you think you're getting. Reality mismatch. I carried on with my chemotherapy and radiation alongside my divorce court proceedings. And I could go on and on like any of us can. But I needed to take responsibility for emotional wellness, welfare, and well-being. Understanding the part that my emotions and propensities had played on my ill health changed the game for me. I began to respond and take action for what needed to be done. One, I needed to undo all the pollution that I had already accumulated. Two, I needed to make sure that I didn't add anything new to the mix. Now, common sense says, if I free myself, of all the hatred, guilt, vile, guile, and all those unproductive, destructive, counterproductive emotions, I will only be doing myself the biggest favor. Wouldn't you agree? The amount of love all of us hold within us should actually be manifesting a very different reality for us. Even within the family structure, we experience so much disorder and disunity. Hostility on most minds, then we talk world peace and play at pretend. Why is the world not one love-filled, peaceful, harmonious unit? Because harmony within equals harmony without. That's why. So I took charge of what needed to be done, made sure that I worked at it systematically, putting in almost 12 years of effort. There are only two horses that drive our mind, love and fear. So you can either operate from fear and doubt, polluting and hijacking yourself, or you can operate from love and faith, helping and nourishing yourself. So as my dad says, use your buddhi, unbiased intelligence. It holds the ability to drop reaction and introduce response in its place. And all that is called for is ego maturity. As balls of energy 12 kilometers in radius, the center of which is our solar plexus, at this point in time, our energies are intermingling way beyond our cognitive abilities. Imagine in this very room how our energies are intermingling and overlapping. We are that intimately connected. The solar plexus is the seat of our primal emotions. It's the place where we carry all our feelings. Watch out for yours at any given point of time. And make sure that you don't feed the collective and feed off the collective. If a handful of us picked up this individual responsibility, this mantle of individual responsibility, 
to become gripe and groan free, complaint and conflict free, domination and control free. We have a changed world. Think about it. So on that note, I would genuinely end with a plea saying let's drop all our personal issues. Let's take our cosmic collective responsibility seriously. Let's commit to that business and contribute towards what needs to be done. As we lay a false pride and ego aside, may our hearts, minds, wills, and spirit meet in purpose. Namaste. <laughs>